I am Mikko Hyppönen, and I've spent my life trying to protect the online security and online privacy. I've spent almost the last 25 years reverse engineering malware, analyzing viruses, and hunting online criminals. Because I strongly believe that if we don't understand where the attacks that we are seeing are coming from, we have no hope in trying to defend against them. And sometimes we succeed. Sometimes we do find the online criminals behind the attacks. Like this one case where we found this guy. He was maybe 26, 27. He was from Romania, from a city in southeast of Romania. And he was involved in running large-scale botnets. So when we caught him, I spoke with him. Spoke with him and I asked him about his, his motives. The way he was making money with his botnets was with keyloggers. So you would get infected with your computer, with one of his malware pieces, and that would start recording your keyboard. That means everything you type will be saved and sent to, these, to the guy who was running the botnet. And the way he made money was that when you were doing online purchases, you would be typing in your name, your address, your credit card number, credit card expiration date, security code. And of course, he could now use your credit card and buy whatever he wants. So clearly, he had some skills. So I was asking him about that, that he knows how to program, he understands protocols, he understands TCP IP. Why is he chosen to be in line of crime? Why did he choose a life of criminal endeavor? And his answer was that, well, it's hard for him to get a job. Where he's living, there's no IT startup scene. Yes, he knows how to program, but apparently the easiest way for him to turn his skills into income was through crime. And that's a clear problem we have, because that's not a technical problem at all. So the lesson here is that these problems really aren't technical. Many of these problems actually are social problems. When you have lots of people with skills, but without opportunities, you end up with problems like this. And while technical problems can be fixed, I can fix technical problems, but I can't fix social problems. And many of these online criminals, of course, never see their victims. They never even think about them. They're like nameless, nameless people somewhere online. But I meet these victims regularly. Like I met this one guy who was living in close to San Francisco in California, who was a startup guy. He had his own startup. We were doing pretty well. He had 80, 90 people working for him in his startup. And he got infected. He didn't get infected with a keylogger, but he got infected with a ransom trojan. And ransom trojans are those which will infect you once again when you surf the web through an exploit kit. And then the ransom trojan is going to encrypt your files and demand a ransom from you if you want to get your files back. And that's exactly what happened to this entrepreneur. His Windows laptop got infected. He never even learned where he actually got the infection from. And then two or three days later, when he got to his laptop, he saw this ransom message on screen telling to him in detail that his files have been encrypted with the RSA 2048 encryption, which is impossible to decrypt without the key. And the attackers have the key. This was the Crypto Wall ransom trojan. Crypto Wall is coming from Russia. It's written by a Russian gang. And the thing that's interesting about ransom trojans is that these criminals actually deliver the goods. If you actually pay the ransom, they will provide you with a program which will decrypt your files. So at least they are honest criminals. But they really have to be honest, because criminals who are in the business of ransom trojans, they need a good reputation, because they know that every single victim is first going to Google for help, try to figure out a way of getting your files back without paying the ransom. And they'll find earlier victims 
who will tell that they couldn't figure out any other way except paying the ransom, but when they paid the ransom, it worked. That's why criminals like these need a good reputation. In fact, some of these ransom Trojan gangs even run online support forums to help their victims who have paid the ransom but can't figure out how to decrypt their files. We've also, um, well, we can actually take a lesson out of that. The lesson is that, well, ransom Trojans are a huge business. Since the ransoms are collected in Bitcoin, we can actually follow the Bitcoin traffic through wallets. And through that, we can estimate that Crypto War Gang has made something somewhere in the range of $300 million with these ransom Trojans. Let's think about that for a while. $300 million. Well, that's amazing. That's, that's a pretty big company. And of course, for them, it's also tax-free. You don't have to pay tax if you're collecting ransoms from your victims. Of course, we are not alone in trying to catch online criminals. We're just a company. We're analyzing malware and trying to find where it's coming from. But we do work with uh, law enforcement. And I had this interesting meeting with the uh, cyber division of the Central Criminal Police of Brazil in Sao Paulo. I met some of their investigators who were working to fight online crime in Brazil. And Brazil is also a hotspot for online crime. In fact, very big part of the world's banking Trojans are coming from Sao Paulo. And in the meeting, I guess I was sort of like the, the ignorant European, sort of like pointing the finger at them that you have this huge problem and criminals from your area are wreaking havoc all over the world. You should do something about it. But one of the investigators told me that, well, yeah, they understand that. They do know that they have criminals in, right there in their neighborhood. But what I should understand is that Sao Paulo is also one of the murder capitals of the world. And when law enforcement has limited resources, where do I really want them to put their resources? Should they be fighting crimes where people actually die? Or should they be fighting these online crimes? And the lesson here is that it's easy to find solutions to problems when you're looking at them from far away. But things are never that easy. And then I met this lady. She had a problem. And the problem was that she had an account on ashleymadison.com. She had an account on ashleymadison.com, which means two months ago, when the user database of 36 and a half million users of this cheating website were leaked online, her name and her email address was in that leak. And people found out. Colleagues at the office learned about it. Neighbors learned about it. Very, very embarrassing. Especially because she wasn't on Ashley Madison to cheat. Quite the contrary. A couple of years earlier, she had suspected her husband for cheating on her. And she suspected her husband had an account on Ashley Madison. So she went to Ashley Madison and registered to try to find her husband from there. She never found him. But nevertheless, the outcome of the whole saga is that now people think she's the cheater. And the lesson here is that we shouldn't jump into conclusions. And all these people with their stories tell me one single story. And that story is that we are failing. We are failing to protect our online security. And we are failing to protect our online privacy. In fact, things are probably getting worse, not better. And we who work in computer security have to start thinking about computer security in new ways. We used to think that our job was to secure computers. Like, I work in computer security, so my job is to secure computers. Well, that's not really the situation anymore. The lights are on in this hall because they are being run by computers and software. 
there's water coming out of the taps because of computers and software. As you're gonna go and have lunch today, that food was made in a food processing plant which is being run by computers and by software. So we computer security people, we are no longer just securing computers. It seems that now our job is to secure the society. And we do have some hope. I mean, things are in some ways getting better. We are getting better and better security built into our devices. Many of the new devices are actually much more restrictive to what the user can do on them. For example, if you have an iPad, even if you're a programmer, you can't really program your own iPad. The only way for you to run your own programs on your own iPad is to take the program, send it to Apple to have it approved, and then you can run it on your own iPad. And these are restrictive technologies, but they also bring us better security. And I'm a strong believer in layered security solutions, where you have multiple different layers built to protect your organization, and you build them so that even if one of the layers fails, or even if multiple layers fail at the same time, the system is resilient, and it can continue working. And we need much more research. We need much new startups in this space to build us better layered security solutions. Layered security could work. Layered security should work. In fact, layered security must work. My name is Mikko Hyppänen. Thank you very much.